most of the activists and organizations out there are trying to solve one problem. On the one hand, that makes sense. You need to focus your effort. On the other, if they only care about the one problem, their work might be fruitless or counterproductive. They might just be plugging up one hole in the dike and creating new holes in the process. But if we want to solve anything, we need to take a broader approach. Single-issue activism won't stop the flood. We'll need education and solidarity, above all, along with direct action. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. This video is brought to you by one of my favorite games, Last Fantasy Ever Part X I I I I I. Square Penix has asked me to be their spokesperson, so I've been playing this game for over a hundred hours now, and I gotta say, we should be in the streets, uniting and organizing the oppressed. As a somewhat atomized society, it's tempting to limit our activism to individual action. We recycle because it's easy, and it enables us to maintain what's ultimately an unsustainable way to live. We march in a parade with a sign saying how angry we are in case the people in power didn't realize what they were doing would make people mad. We write blogs and tweets and make YouTube channels to educate, you know, whoever. Hope you benefit. But ideally, education would lead to organizing for self-liberation. Education should mean people realize for themselves where their problems come from, then work together to solve them. It should be done in groups and from as young an age as possible. Because the thing is, we have no power on our own. We only have power when we unite with others to achieve our goals. But in our culture, we're taught to see problems as individual problems that we have to solve on our own. We're not supposed to realize enough people with a common cause can change the world. We're supposed to just keep recycling and going to work. So a purely individual approach to solving social problems will probably fail every time. But there are also a million activists and organizations fighting for one cause with a limited scope. They're conducting single-issue campaigns when, as Audre Lorde said, we don't live single-issue lives. I find atheist activists a great example of single-issue campaigners. I mean, I'm an atheist, but I'm talking about people who make opposition to religion their whole political identity. They talk about freedom, but then they say it's freedom from religious influence over government. Well, okay, what about freedom from all lobby group influence over government? What about freedom from government? <laughs> what about freedom from racism? Or freedom from working all day? But if you only think of freedom in very narrow terms, you'll only address a narrow kind of freedom and turn a blind eye to millions of kinds of oppression. You won't look for people fighting oppression in other ways, like freeing prisoners and closing prisons, because you won't think of your issues as related. But issues of justice and freedom are all related. My freedom depends on the freedom of everyone else, because if some people are oppressing others, who's to say I won't be next? And it's probably the same people, or more accurately, the same system, oppressing all of us. There are often campaigns to stop laws from being passed. Look at all the outcry against restrictive internet regulations and intrusive surveillance. It's good to speak out against this kind of thing, but the critique needs to be structural. It needs to explain why the people in power want this bill, you know, how it'll get them more power or money. And why it's so hard, even for widespread popular outrage, to get things done. 
It's okay to assign blame in specific instances, but it needs to be explained that the power of these people derives from their position in the power structure, or their money and connections. And this is the inevitable result of letting people use a system of force to accumulate money and power. If you want to solve your single problem but you don't understand other problems, you'll come up with the wrong solutions. If you don't take a more holistic view of things, you might ease one problem by exacerbating another. Of course, the people involved might be well aware. Kicking the homeless out of your community does nothing to solve the problem of homeless people, and people doing it, they know that. Their campaign is not worth accomplishing. But they have money, and money makes things happen. But that said, money isn't the only thing that makes things happen. Organization and popular rage can do it too. The people are afraid of popular rage, so they try appealing to the state. To solve their problem. There might be several reasons for that, depending how they think the state works. For one thing, we need permits and licenses from the state to do anything without the risk of getting shut down by the police. We're trained to expect our freedom to be restricted, as if we were all teenagers hoping to go out on a school night, rather than adults trying to build homes for the homeless. The state paints itself as the institution that solves problems, rather than being a monopoly on permission to solve problems. The state is also a monopoly on robbery, which in typical subterfuge they call taxation. Because of this monopoly, the state has as much money as it can get away with taking from us. Coupled with the propaganda making us believe the state is supposed to solve problems, we expect it to use some proportion of its enormous budget to do what we tell it. That's why people think raising taxes might solve something. But the state doesn't have to do what we want. So it doesn't. If any policy or law or other measure would change the balance of power, it doesn't get passed. If you force it to pass legislation, the state can repeal or ignore it. The state controls budgets, so whatever it once promised, it can always cut the budgets of agencies that you might have liked and divert them to something that might be higher priority to them. Mm -hmm. People who have disproportionate influence, like celebrities, sometimes use their fame and some of their wealth to bring awareness to an issue, or even get active in fighting for a cause. And sometimes it can be positive. What hardly any of them do is question the system as a whole, because like their peers, they don't want to give up their wealth and their position. They might just have a greater conscience that's eased when they take up a cause. And however much money they and their friends have, they'll be asking you to donate. Give money for comic relief. We'll just be doing what we do every day anyway, telling jokes. You pay. And then we fawn over them for being so concerned about the homeless or the environment. They should use their influence to talk about how we live under a system of violence and support people who are fighting that system. If their cause is homelessness, don't just say we need to help them. Everyone knows that. People need to understand the reason there are homeless people. Land and property are privately owned. If someone else owns it, they'll either kick you off it or charge you money for staying there. The state monopolizes the land and rents it out to homeowners or landlords, and landlords rent it out to the rest of us. Building tiny homes will provide temporary relief, but it won't change relations of ownership, which are the root of the problem. Charities and NGOs have a similar problem with their celebrity patrons. They rely on the existing system, like government and the wealthy, for donors so they can't rock the boat. They focus on their one issue, easing the pain of the effects of ongoing problems.
problems, instead of addressing their roots and tackling them head on. I don't just want to see soup kitchens. I want to see homeless people organizing mutual aid and self-defense. I don't think we should call for climate change legislation, which we know will be watered down, when we should be addressing the worst polluters. Like these guys. Or these guys. Or maybe even these guys. Why is it they can get away with huge amounts of pollution and everyone says it's the government who has to do something? It lets the people making the decisions and the system that incentivizes these decisions off the hook. If they're killing life on this planet, why shouldn't we stop them directly? Well, it's illegal. And I have trouble respecting these celebrities who use their influence to promote gun control. We don't need more gun control as long as there are people out there trying to kill you. The people most in need of guns are black, brown, and indigenous people, as they are more likely to be the victims of murder. However, they're also the first people to get their guns taken away from them. Which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who knows they live under a white supremacist state. By the way, sources for these claims can be found in the video description, in case you didn't believe it because you didn't know what a white supremacist state looks like. White supremacy will always be a useful way to divide and conquer. People with influence over the state will always have access to guns. So please stop promoting gun control as an isolated concept. Try addressing the roots of violence, rather than petitioning the state to disarm people it decides are a threat. The state is concentrated force. It doesn't do what people want it to, because it doesn't have to. It forces you not the other way around. Usually when people say they're demanding the state do something, they aren't actually demanding. Demanding implies you have the means to back up your demand with an or else. Protesters might threaten to with withhold their vote, but that's not a big deal if the politicians are getting their orders from lobbyists with deep pockets. And in a system where there are only two or three candidates to choose from, one of which will be imposed on you regardless, a politician only needs to be perceived as the least bad to win. So where's the demand? It's like if I demanded you hit like on this video. Well, what's to make you? There's no threat. Hit like or else I won't do anything differently. That's hardly an ultimatum. On the other hand, if we're talking about more than peaceful, polite, day-at-the-park demonstrations, but direct action, like we saw in Hong Kong in 2019, it makes sense to have demands, especially when you can write them all into catchy three-character slogans like this, because you promise to stop rioting, blocking traffic, whatever, when the demands are met. Such demands can be useful for mobilizing people, and can make some gains, however minor. I think it's fair to say working through the system to make major changes is futile. But that's not to say nothing can get done through the state. Riots and disruptions might force them to act, though before they do what you want, they will engage in extreme repression. Referendums have been used to legalize drugs and abortion, which means they've saved some people's lives and saved many more from prison, and have given the police one fewer reason to ruin your life. But of course, referendums can be used to do things politicians don't want to risk because they don't want to get their hands dirty, like Brexit. So even referendums can be dicey. Either way, I wouldn't count on a politician or party to save you. As soon as they get enough power to be able to change something, they find they don't want to. 
They just needed something to promise on the campaign trail. For someone in power, the bigger the state, the better. Politicians pass new legislation every day. The more legislation, the more departments and agencies there are, the wider their scope, the more employees they have, and the bigger their budgets. If you have power, you're not about to give it up willingly. However much outcry against proposed laws or however publicly despised the agency, ICE, I'm looking at you, it doesn't matter. Unless the people force the state to change, and that's really rare. It stays intact and continues to grow unabated. And as I explain here, passing new laws that sound nice doesn't solve a lot of problems either. Because there's no doubt lots of people have spoken out against ICE or the police or particularly oppressive laws, surveillance, and egregious trade deals. They write articles, they write to their so-called representatives, they even change their profile pics. And yet, nothing. Do the people in power just not hear us? No, they just don't care. You haven't made them care. So people start small and set their expectations low, and they cause just as much trouble as a result. One misguided campaign in the U.S. led to the banning of plastic straws in cities around the country, despite the unheard or unheeded protestations from activists pointing out some disabled people need plastic straws and they can't always just carry a metal one around. There are likely to be victims of any change, but there are victims who can afford it, like a rich person losing a little property, and the far more common victims who are already excluded and marginalized and impoverished. Your campaign should include disabled people, and not just for pictures on pamphlets, but for making decisions with everybody else. It should have black, brown, and indigenous people in leadership positions because white people tend to forget about them. It should include gay and trans people since their needs might be different from cishets. This is how we should organize. We don't just want to mobilize people to get them out with a sign. We want to organize them. One of the most impressive mobilizations of people I've seen in my lifetime was the worldwide protests against the 2003 war on Iraq. One scholar concluded some 36 million people around the world marched, including 3 million in Rome. There were demonstrations, protests, candlelit vigils. Students walked out of their classes. They even had celebrities. But while the demonstrations may have influenced some governments not to send troops, the war went ahead anyway. I think the simplest way to explain why is to consider the difference between mobilization and organization. Our task is not to teach the conscious to be, to teach the unconscious to be conscious, but to make them conscious of their unconscious behavior. Because unconsciously, instinctively, they seek freedom. What we must do is make them conscious. Look, you want freedom anyway. Let's be serious. Let's sit down. Let's plan it. Let's wait protracted war and let's tear down the system and walk on to liberation. It's as simple as that. This aspect of the unconscious becoming conscious is linked to mobilization and organization, something we mentioned last year. We must make clear distinctions between mobilizers and organizers. To be an organizer, you must be a mobilizer. But being a mobilizer doesn't make you an organizer. Much confusion is to be found here. Malcolm X was a great mobilizer. He was a great organizer. Martin Luther King was a great mobilizer. He was not a great organizer. These facts can be easily seen from King and Malcolm. When Malcolm went to a place, he left a mosque. When King went to demonstrations, he broke down desegregation and he moved on. 
As a matter of fact, King was not concerned with organization to the point that even though he was the most popular Baptist preacher in America without the shadow of a doubt and probably beyond the shadow of a doubt the most loved, he could not become president of the Baptist National Baptist Association, a convention. Yeah, so many of them. The National Baptist Convention. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if my memory serves me correctly now, and I remember it was Mohammed Speaks that uh, carried the article on the front page in 1964 when King tried to become president of the National uh, Baptist Convention. There was so much confusion there that a minister was actually put, pushed off the stage and died in the struggle. Yeah. And of course, King lost. The man who won was a reactionary man by the name of Jackson. He never did nothing for the people, never cared about the people, just was a pork chop minister who used their money to put gas in his big Cadillac. But he was organized. But he was organized. We say that we must come to know the difference between mobilization and organization because the enemy will use mobilization to demobilize us. Mobilization is very easy very very easy because since we're people who are instinctively ready to respond against acts of injustice anytime there's one little act of injustice we can blow it up and we'll find people who come and make some mass demonstration around it miss sally lost her job let's rally she will get her job back people will come and rally so and so got kicked out of school because the teachers unjust the unjust the people will come and rally they will come to rally at issues and this is what mobilization does. It mobilizes people around issues. Those of us who are revolutionary are not concerned with issues. We're concerned with the system. The difference must be properly understood. The difference must be properly understood. Mobilization usually leads for reform action, not to revolutionary action. If we would look scientifically at the October 16th million and more march, we would see clearly that this was a mobilized event, not an organized event. We must know clearly the difference between mobilization and organization. One of the characteristics of mobilization is that it is temporary. Organization is permanent and eternal. Clear differences must be made because the unconscious can usually be captured easily around one issue items, around mobilization items, but it's hard to catch them around organization. But these unconscious must be brought to organization. We must transform mobilization to organization. We shouldn't just mobilize because there's an issue. We should organize to attack the system. The anti-war campaigns of 2002 and 3 failed not because they couldn't mobilize enough people to march, but because they couldn't organize enough people to do enough that would actually disrupt the war. There were some attempts to shut down whole cities, but not with a lot of success. We have to analyze things carefully, including understanding how propaganda and ideology work, because they lay the groundwork for everything we're supposed to believe. If we don't question the values the ruling class inculcate in us, we will fight for the wrong thing. I don't care about crime. I care about violence. I don't care about petty theft or trespassing. I care about poverty. I don't care about unemployment. I care if people have food and shelter and freedom and love and respect. I don't care that people are on welfare. I care that people are so impoverished they're forced to rely on it and that there are millions of people who would shame them for it. I don't care about illegal immigration. I care that millions of people's freedom to move around the, around the earth is killed by nationalists every day who don't care about freedom. Now, a lot of activists work to further a single cause, but they don't care about just the one cause. They care about much more than that, something much broader. That way, they can address one thing at a time, but still take a broad overview of the issues, so they're not stepping on anyone's toes. That's what happens when solidarity is a principle. 
You have your efforts in one or another area, but you sympathize with and, when possible, aid people who are working on related issues. And all our issues are related. Our most immediate problems tend to be from a lack of money, if not health. And since we're accustomed to trying to solve our problems on our own, we see financial troubles as individual problems, millions of separate problems, rather than one systemic problem. Why do most people have money trouble? Why does the state never do what most people want it to? Why does the political system hinder rather than help efforts to solve social and environmental problems? Why are so many measures supposedly intending to end racism focused on changing logos and mascots rather than the systemic changes people are calling for? We're talking about the same system. If you assume the claims of this system, like that it represents you or it exists to make you free or there's no more racism, you won't be able to understand when it acts differently. You won't think to stand in solidarity with this system's victims. You might think, ah, it's all their fault. After all, they didn't do all those things we're told every day by authority you have to do. There are plenty of people out there already operating along the principle of solidarity, taking a broader approach. They often define their views or their organizations as abolitionist and decolonial. Decolonizing? Decolonizationist? Maybe. Those are vague terms, of course, and that's fine because they're distant goals. But the people are probably working in the short term on things like freeing prisoners and decriminalizing drugs and sex work. They might be affiliated with mutual aid organizations that don't just feed but empower the poor and the workers. The point is, our liberation can only be accomplished by organizing with people who also want to be free. Only a clear understanding of the systems we live under and a lot of organizing will get us there. Thank you.